Warning, you're about to see some very strange cars. If you find yourself saying phrases like, what on earth, I don't believe that, or why did they do that? This is quite normal and is expected from first seeing the unexpected. For these are concept cars. Hello, I'm Howard Stableford and in this series I'll take you into another world as I introduce you to a whole range of vehicles you'll never see in the supermarket car park, in your neighbour's drive, nor even on the showroom forecourt. For these are concept cars, the one-offs created by the world's car companies, a showcase for their talents. In tonight's programme and over the next three months, You'll learn about cutting-edge technologies, bizarre experimental modes of transport, the incredible shrinking car, the world's safest car, the car that responds to your emotions, and the cars that are just too beautiful for words. Plus, we'll meet the world's top designers, and in exclusive interviews, find out how the car design process works, and we'll even show you round the inner sanctum of a leading design studio. Then we'll drop in on people like Andy Saunders, the South Coast-based concept car enthusiast who loves them so much he's built not one, but two exact replicas of famous concept cars from the 1950s. We'll meet him along with the cream of the crop of Britain's young designers who will create our transport of the future. But we won't forget the really wacky stuff in this series either. The crazy, the unusual, the amazing concept cars which are quite often hopelessly impractical, but are lovable nonetheless for it. So, fasten your seatbelts and let's embark on a journey to Planet Concept. Now here's a problem we encounter all the time, don't we? Driving to a lunch spot, trying to impress a pretty girl beside you, you see a parking space outside the cafe, but it's too small to fit your lovely car in. The shame, the embarrassment. But there's no problem with this concept car from the Swiss manufacturer Rinspeed. All you have to do is simply push a button and the car gets smaller. It actually contracts. This is really crazy Alice in Wonderland stuff, like it's got a built-in crusher. Suddenly, the car can easily fit into the space. The girl loves you and the day is saved. What a great idea. Well, let's get back to our happy couple. After lunch and a spot of fruit and veg purchasing at the local market, they find another problem. Uh-oh! There's no space in order to drive their glorious groceries back to their no-doubt swish pad. Kinda problem, minor Liebchen. The car that was parked behind has conveniently gone. So, let's push another button and the fruit and veg carrying capabilities of this concept car have dramatically increased. Wow! We each year we build a new concept car for the Geneva Motor Show and traditionally all our cars have a movement, some kinematics in them and we were asking ourselves what bothers the people today the most in traffic and one of it is certainly space. And we all do know that the Smart is a great car yet on the weekend when you do your big shopping, take your mother-in-law along, then you're in trouble. So we figured wouldn't it be great to have both of the good worlds, a small car for the week, you just commute with your briefcase and on the weekend you have four seats and ample of space. So the idea popped up to hit a button, wait 10 seconds and you have two. The Rinspeed concept seems to be a great idea on the surface but of course think about it a little bit and you realise the car is highly impractical. Think of the fail-safe systems you'd have to build in so you wouldn't crush anybody in the back seats by accident. Well, uh, you have to be realistic in a way, but if you want to move things in life, you have to go a step beyond, you have to go a step further, and we do not want to design a sports car number 742 styling exercise. For me, this is boring. 
I think you have to polarize, you have to get people thinking and to people move. Plus, of course, did you notice how the people got out of the car? Did you notice them opening the doors? Come on now, be honest, did you? You didn't actually because we didn't show you. Let's look again in slow motion at the Telltale Legover. Aha! There are no doors on this car, which is a bit of a major design problem, isn't it? It is a car without roof, it's a car without doors, so you've got to be a bit sporty to get in and out. You see, there can't be any doors on a car like this, since the side panels have to have the expanding mechanism built into them. Do. The task of a concept car is, if you want, uh, to put it this way, to get a domino play into rolling, into falling the stones. And that's uh, our message that the manufacturers think about new concept of mobility, new concepts of combining two cars into one. Plus, the extra metal work to make the car go bigger and smaller will almost certainly make the whole vehicle really heavy. I bet it steers like a cow. OK, pay attention now, please. Listen carefully to what this nice Japanese gentleman is about to tell you. It's now the 21st century. So how are automobiles going to change? What if we thought of cars not as tools, but as partners? And what if, as the relationship deepened and the heart became involved, car and owner grew together? Excuse me? What the heck's he on about? Car and owner grow together. And can we really trust a man whose Japanese voice has been dubbed into American very badly? Let me introduce you. Personalization on demand. POD is here. Basically, the pod is a, is a design between, a collaboration between Sony and Toyota uh, to actually look into the future about how a car can actually react with a, its driver and also its occupants. It's a very, very clever innovation. It's actually driven, there's no steering wheel, it's actually driven and controlled via a uh, joystick on your, operated by your right hand. Um, and what this does, it actually picks up your pulse and your body's uh, levels of perspiration in your body. And the reason it does that is to actually detect what kind of mood you're in so that the car can actually react and calm you down and have a calming influence and make you a safer driver and other drivers as well aware of your um, particular mood in the car. And so, for example, if the car is going to be um, stuck in traffic, it will actually warn ahead of your destination. For example, if you've got a meeting, it will actually phone ahead and actually arrange that you will be late for that meeting and slow you down so you, it minimizes, totally minimizes road rage. When the driver gets close to his beautiful machine, the car is programmed to flash lights that are supposed to say, hi, how are you today? Right. Pod is meant to express a range of emotions. For example, if the driver skips up to the car quite fast, the car gets, well, sort of excited and looks happy. For goodness sake, the car even wags its tail. If a mean dude cuts you up the lights, the Toyota pod senses this and puts on an angry expression on the bonnet. Ooh, that's not very nice, is it? And believe it or not, if you're getting low on fuel, your car looks sad, like this. How you notice this from sitting inside is another matter. Parts of this car will, will come into effect in the future, but uh, at the moment it's all just a very, very um, wild concept car that, to show really how a, a car can react with its owner. Well, let's get back to see what Mr. Out of Sync has to say now. An important item that's designed to help you get closer to your POD is the Mini POD. A driver can make this mini POD learn his preferences at home or at the office, including his favorite TV programs, the kind of music he likes, and addresses of websites he thinks are useful. Then every time he gets in the POD, the car updates its driver database, adding or rewriting as necessary. Gradually, the POD becomes a car that has conformed itself to its driver. And so it becomes the ultimate IT personal car. Wow, man becomes machine, machine becomes man, whichever. The pod has some other surprises. Look, Ma, no steering wheel. Or pedals. 
Everything you see can be controlled with just one hand. Yes, everything, by what they call the drive controller. Everything is fly-by-wire controlled, so there are no mechanical connections. Braking, acceleration, gear shifting and steering are all done with one hand. Is this really more accurate than our current system though? Long live the steering wheel, I say. Well, as with all concept cars, um, it's actually been built to gauge a public reaction. So um, various aspects of it may be used in the future for other cars for, or even the pod itself. Who knows? This is rather neat though. Flashing headlights, as you know, can mean anything from I'll let you go to get out of the way, you idiot. But the pod can actually talk to other pods using a variety of light, sound and radio signals. Plus, you can wag your tail at other cars. Does this mean you're a happy dog or an angry cat? Now, this is just getting silly. But, you know, I think I hate this function. The car senses if the driver's stressed, then automatically plays the driver's favourite music or a selection of soothing sound effects. Also, if the driver's favourite restaurant is nearby, it may display up on the screen the menu to tempt the driver to stop and to relax. Mmm, noodles! What it'll do is it'll actually um, slow the car down, actually um, switch on the air conditioning or even open the windows if necessary and actually play some soft soothing music so that it basically gives you a, a much sort of calmer ambience. The car even rewards good driving habits. Nanny state or what? It is, it, it, it is big brother definitely but particularly as the, uh, the thing which is called the pod is a, is a, a handheld controller and that can be placed inside your house and for example if um, you were with your family and you were going out for the day and you were talking about all the different places you'd like to go it would actually pick up your um, conversation with this uh, what we call dedicated short-range communication it will actually pick up information and when you're actually in the car it will give you a scrolled view of things that you may have spoken about places of interest for example and play those on via the internet play them on a scrolled uh, display so I wonder if you drive really badly does the car automatically call the police and read you your rights through the loudspeaker You know, maybe there will be a day when we could buy something like the Mercedes F200, the Life Jet, the Jeep Compass, or even the Honda Unibox. Well, maybe not the Unibox. Before we reveal the bizarre details of the Unibox, a word to the wise about some concept car basics. If you're on the search for something really different, then you really need to visit a car show in Japan. Look behind the doors of the Tokyo Motor Show and you'll be whisked to a world of science fiction and pure fantasy. In this particular world, practicality isn't just put on the back burner, it hasn't even been taken out of the freezer yet. Quite often, design studies are created where it seems their architects haven't just been given a completely free reign, they've lost their sharp as crayons in the mad rush to ring their psychiatrists. Well, maybe this is a little unfair, because the usual official car company explanation of the strangest concept cars is that they're exploring the frontiers of car design, technology and innovation. But you have to ask yourself why companies go down this strange route if it doesn't lead to anything that the public might actually buy and make money? For example, let's check out the innovation on one of Honda's answers to the mini MPV revolution. This is called the Bulldog. Now surely in this market the idea is to have huge windows to look out of to stop the kids getting bored. However, for some reason here, the design team have come up with narrow side slits. Yet strangely there's a huge rear window which no passengers can use. However, it does let thieves see what's in your boot. The mysteries don't stop there. Ignoring the road illegal slit headlights, the interior has a totally impractical mix of hard seating and metallic services, 
great for robots, I'm sure, but not for us comfort-seeking humans. The Honda Bulldog looks stylish on the move, though, and it seems that Honda have kept mere mortals' needs satisfied with a sat-nav system to get you and your family to the wilds reliably. And when you get there, you can open that huge hatch at the back to reveal your instant assembly push bikes. These are no normal bikes. The sat-nav information you are looking at in the car is now transferred to your bike. Now this seems a good idea, but surely it's a bit over the top. Do we really need sat-nav on our push bikes for heaven's sake? So we'll pat the bulldog on the head, wave bye-bye and welcome on stage another concept from Honda, their Model X. This is a tough, rugged off-roader type. The split suicide doors open to reveal yet another set of hard, unyielding seats with no comfort whatsoever. At least the seats can be folded into some sort of bed, but you're not going to get much kip here. What's wrong with normal car seat cushions? Maybe the Japanese haven't heard of the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. With room for a surfboard or two, an interesting idea, there's nothing really new here. Unlike the next offering, are you ready for this one? This is the Unibox, dubbed by Honda as the Multi-Life Terminal. We're showing you an interior shot first because we don't want to shock you too much to begin with. True, it looks more like a building on wheels and, well, you're not wrong. This is more like a mobile shopping arcade, an exhibition hall on wheels. With the aerodynamics of the family-sized fridge, the Honda Unibox concept car is surely a study in design with not even a nod towards practicality. This project has obviously been put forward as a test of materials and maybe even a test of human beings. I bet some twisted designer boffins get a kick out of watching visitors at the car shows. The sort of visitors who will be nudging their open-mouthed mates, whispering, What the heck is that all about? There is no way in this world or the next that a vehicle like the Honda Unibox could ever be built as a production car. It looks like there's not even space for an engine. Perhaps it runs on faith. The Unibox belongs to a category of concept car which is designed to break all the rules and conventions of car design just in case something astonishingly new comes out in the process. And let's face it, concepts like this are really designed to pull in the punters at the international car shows. But here's a concept which is still astonishing to look at but could really point the way to the supercars of the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you the V6 Dual Note. Well, this concept car, the Dual Note, it's um, a vision of what we could be doing with hybrid cars in the future. The, um, it has the same concept of a, an engine as our Insight, so it's an electric and petrol engine car, but it's a V6, 3 litre, generates 400 horsepower, and it uh, gives you a sporting insight to what we could be doing. The, the idea of the um, integrated motor as part of the engine, not, not a separate electric motor and a separate um, petrol engine, they're integrated together. So although it's a V6, um, we still have the motor next to the engine. And also the, the VTEC system, that's something that you see in Honda cars today, but we're always progressing and trying to look at how to improve it for the future to offer the customer something more. It's August 1998, and under the heat of the Moroccan sun, a team of France's creative cream have been charged with bringing the world's press the first pictures of an astonishing new concept car. Tempers are getting high, the model's getting bored, and the light is never quite right. Even the air isn't right. But eventually, the images are duly recorded, and another concept car hits their headlines. The car looks futuristic, it has sharp lines, and at first glance, it looks awfully impractical. It's obviously a futuristic concept design with no real future as a production car, just as a pointer to the future. It's even got a daft name, the Valsatis. The designer of the Valsatis is Renault's Patrick Lequemont. As a generalist manufacturer, contrary to, let's say, Mercedes, who one would refer to as being a specialist, uh, we have to make sure that uh, our customers will buy us, uh, will buy our cars, and if 
if they buy them, then clearly it's not by doing a an imitation of a Mercedes or an imitation of a BMW. So our, our complete strategy is based upon offering totally different products, which are very much uh, in terms of uh, uh, inspiration, not over the Rhine or over the Channel, but in fact very French in, in terms of approach. And it's not uh, you know, a question of nationalism, it's not, uh, it's not that. It's, uh, we feel that um, uh, as a European, we have to defend Frenchness. In the same way that de Gaulle said uh, about Goethe, he said, you know, Goethe was so much of a European because he was so German. And I think that our cars are going to be desirable if we offer something very different. But of course, the Velsatis wasn't destined to be dumped in automotive history as just a bizarre left field concept with not even a wheel in the real world. Renault shocked the world by announcing that the Valsatis had the green light to be actually made as a mainstream Renault production vehicle. With some changes from the concept on the practicality, legality and budget front, the Renault Valsatis hits the roads in spring 2002 and Richard Hammond was sent to test drive one. Renault have decided that the biggest luxury a car can afford us isn't just the bells and whistles and gizmos, it's space. So they've equipped the Velsatis with tons of it and it is enormous in here, there is so much headroom. And it's not just the physical space that makes it feel big in here either, there's loads of glass and it's lightly coloured so it feels light, bright and airy. The Velsatis' biggest, biggest trick though is this interior because by comparison, think about it, cars like Mercedes, BMW, even some Audi, the usual luxury cars, feel a bit gloomy. It's just that bit different. It's a bit more like sitting in a very stylish living room. So if Renault could create a futuristic vehicle as the Velsatis that actually becomes a production car, doesn't this signal that more manufacturers could be taking huge leaps forward in design?